Everyone, thank you for joining us this morning at Crossbridge Online. I'm Wes, I'm a pastor, and we are really excited to have you here with us today, especially if it's your first time joining us for a worship gathering. Thank you so much for checking us out and exploring faith here. I want to let you know about a few things as we get ready to go this morning. And the first is, I'd love to invite you just to share this, uh, hit the share link on Facebook or YouTube. Invite some folks to join with you. It's always more fun when we're able to do these things together. And we'd love for you to participate in that with some other folks who are able to help you learn and grow and bounce ideas off each other. It's just a really, really great thing. And we want to encourage you to do that this morning. Secondly, if you're new Thank you so much for being here. We actually want to bless you with just some free ice cream. It's kind of hot outside, and so some free Dairy Queen will make everyone feel better. You can just text I'm new to 850-583-0712, and we'll hook you up with all that. I promise we won't spam you or bug you a ton or anything. We just want to have a way to say thank you so much for being a part of our gathering here this morning. Finally, I want to let you know uh, that we have a bulletin available. It's online at crossroadschristian.com slash bulletin. And if you go there, there's all kinds of scriptures, instructions, uh, another kind of copy of some of the announcements and highlights we'll have all throughout our service today that can help guide you through this experience. And so we'd love for you to check that out there as well. With all that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Liz and Brian on our worship team, and they're going to lead us this morning. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for your our joy and prize, to see the captives' hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's call. Church, and we pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Send your church on fire when this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray unleash your kingdom's power Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. church on fire when this nation back 
change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Psalm 57, 7 and 8 says this. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robes as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. that has always really resonated with me comes from Psalm 8, where the psalmist writes, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? And I think it's always stood out to me because it hinted this tension I've always felt, maybe you always felt too, about God, that 
And he's a great big old God out there. How can he have space and room to deal with a small little individual like me? In his book, Mere Christianity, the great uh, Christian writer C.S. Lewis gives us an example of an author writing a book. And he's trying to make the illustration that as crazy as this sounds to us, as out of this world as this sounds to us, God lives outside of space and time. He is not constrained by anything. And he compares this idea of God living outside of space and time to be kind of like an author writing a book. And that you could sit down and you could write a sentence, Mary was walking around in the kitchen when all of a sudden she heard a knock at the door. And C.S. Lewis makes this point that maybe in the book world, in Mary's world, you know, that knock comes and immediately she has to walk to the door. But of course, to the author, he lives outside of the time he's created within his novel. In fact, the author could write, Mary was in the kitchen, and then spend hours thinking about Mary. Because he, he lives outside of the context of the time in this little world that he has created. And kind of drawing this metaphor to a close, C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, God is not hurried along in the time stream of this universe any more than an author is hurried along in the imaginary time of his own novel. He has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. He does not have to deal with us in the mass. And I think that's a beautiful illustration of how God deals with us. The God, yes, he has care for the great big old wide world, right? He, he cares about this planet, this space. He cares about all of humanity. But the beauty is God doesn't just care for all of humanity. He cares for you. And he cares for me. And when Jesus took upon himself the cross, bearing the burden of our sin and our shame and our failures and our faults and all the stuff that we run up against, he did it not just because he cares for the world, but because he cares about you. <laughs> and in ways that go beyond our comprehension, God loves and cares about you so much. You are always on his mind. And as Jesus offered his life in your place and in my place on the cross, we were on his mind as well because God loves you. We're getting ready to take our time of communion here together this morning, and I'd encourage you to go ahead and grab whatever elements you might have to stand in for bread and for juice this morning. And as we take that, I encourage you to reflect on this gift of God, of God's grace, that God, God doesn't just deal with the world in mass, that God loves, cares about, and values you. <laughs> and that's a beautiful reason for worship. Let me pray, and then we'll take communion together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. God, that you are beyond our comprehension. You live outside the borders of space and time. And Lord, also, that you love us so much that you gave your life for us. Lord, help us to worship, to appreciate, to love, to adore, and to see the magnitude of this gift. We give you thanks and praise. Amen.
I am back to share with you some highlights and announcements about things happening in our gathering this morning and around our church. The first thing is our connection card, and that's available at crossbridgechristian.com slash connect. And that's a great place for you to go if you'd like to receive prayer, take a next step, if we can help you grow in your faith, or if you'd like to connect in community around here or serve somewhere, uh, you can do all of that. Just head to crossbridgechristian.com slash connect, and we'll follow up with you this week. The second thing I want to let you know about is a really big highlight for us. We are planning on regathering together in one service as a church next weekend, September 20th. Uh, this has been a decision a long time in the making. Many of you have participated in our surveys and stuff we've done to try and gauge people's interests. We've been keeping a close watch on COVID cases in our community. And our leadership team has prayerfully and thoughtfully decided that next weekend, uh, we've got the preparations in place and we are ready to go and ready to be a part of it. And we wanna invite you to do that with us. We have all of our regathering guidelines and safety procedures available in the website we've created to help you feel comfortable and ready to engage this process. That's all at crossbridgechristian.com slash regathering. Uh, just a couple of key highlights for us. Uh, we're gonna have masks at all of our worship services from everyone, myself included. Uh, we're gonna have temperature checks as you come in, uh, which is actually part of Leon County Schools policy. Um, we will have uh, increased and enhanced social distancing and even the ways we enter and exit the facility uh, to try and make sure that we're doing our best to keep everyone safe. You can see all the details of our plan, again, at that website we've created. Just one word here as we kind of head into this next chapter as a church. Um, there are kind of two things that are functioning together here. One is kind of some systemic processes, and the other is some good old-fashioned self-policing, okay? We as a church want to do everything that we can to create the systemic processes that are going to keep us safe. That, that's stuff like asking everyone to wear a mask, doing temperature checks, having enhanced distancing, and stuff like that at our services. Those are things that we want to do to make sure that we have all the systems in place that we can uh, to be able to keep folks safe, okay? But this is also going to require some self-policing from you, right? All the systemic measures in the world don't make any difference if we aren't good at taking personal responsibility for enforcing them. So please, I encourage you to go to that website, again, crossbridgechristian.com slash regathering. Familiarize yourself with those procedures so you're ready next weekend. And of course, if you have any questions, please reach out, contact us, let us know, fill out a connection card. We want to be helpful to you throughout this process. Of course, as we've always said, uh, those of you who are not comfortable yet to regather, that's totally fine. That doesn't make you a subpar Christian. That doesn't make you a second-class citizen here. We will continue to have online gatherings available for you. We will continue to offer our services online until you feel safe coming back. We do not want to force you into a situation where you're uncomfortable until you are ready to engage with that. So please, please, please use caution and discretion as you see fit. But I'm excited for our church to move into this next chapter. As we hopefully regather and get into that rhythm on September 27th, which is actually the second weekend we'll be back from regathering, we're going to have another blood drive. The big red bus is going to be out at Oak Ridge. And so literally you can come to church, give blood, go worship, do whatever you want there. Uh, we'll have times available from 830 to 130 on Sunday, September 27th. And you can sign up. Uh, for a slot at crossbridgechristian.com slash blood drive. We'd encourage you uh, to give and to be for Tallahassee and to make a difference in our community. Finally, I just want to remind you about giving. You can give online at crossbridgechristian.com slash give. You can text an amount to 84321 uh, or you can give by mail at the address on the screen. Your giving accomplishes a number of things, but one of the really cool things we're celebrating right now is we have actually sent two of our very own, Donovan and Sarah Grice Fitzgerald, are uh, working with a mission organization called New International. And this week they hit a really key fundraising number. We are so proud of them. They are one of the missionaries that we actually support as a church. When you give here, you aren't just helping disconnected people connect to God right here in Tallahassee. You are giving to support the work of God happening all over our country and all over the world. So thank you so much for giving, and we'd love to encourage you to do that today. Today's message is going to be presented to us by Jason Fudge, one of our leadership team members, and he's going to wrap up our Taking Responsibility series. I'm going to turn it over to him right now. Good morning. My name is Jason. I'm a member of the leadership team here at Crossbridge. Thank you for joining us today. About a month ago, Wes asked me if I'd be willing to speak today, 
And I do what most people do when they're confronted with something outside of their comfort zone. I ignored it. Then he asked me again a week later, and I told him that my initial response would be to say no, because normally I have this prompting that makes writing the sermon just a little bit easier, and I didn't have anything. I was also feeling kind of lazy because I didn't want to do the hard work of studying, preparing, and practicing to give the sermon. But another part of me wanted to say yes, because I knew it would lead to my personal growth, and hopefully yours as well. So I reluctantly said yes, still not knowing what I was going to talk about. Then a week later, he sends me the topic, the parable of the talents. And as I began to study and read, I realized how much it applied to the very situation I was struggling with. It was the prompting that I was looking for. The parable of the talents is the last in a series of parables by Jesus in the book of Matthew. Jesus used parables to make his message easier to understand. It begins in Matthew 25, chapter 25, verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. At the time of this parable, a talent was a unit of measure. The exact amount isn't that important, what is important to know is that even one talent was very valuable. So each servant got something very valuable. However, because we're human, we like to simplify things and say that the first servant received five times as much as the third servant, and the second servant received twice as much as the third servant. We get hung up on the differences and we begin to compare. So when we look around at what other people have been entrusted with, we compare. It is so easy to get caught up in the comparison game by focusing on what we don't have instead of being faithful to what we do have. When I look around, I can say, everybody sings better than me, he has more money than me, or this person has more stuff than I do. Sometimes we even say, I would like to be more like that person. When we focus on our perceived deficiencies we can use that as an excuse for our inaction. And this irresponsibility doesn't just affect those who have less. It can also affect those who seem to have more. Benjamin Franklin said that the person who is good at making excuses is seldom good at making anything else. When I look around at people who have less than me, I can think I'm doing great at maximizing what God has given me because I'm looking at the quantity, not the quality of my effort. Whether we've been entrusted with a lot or what we perceive to be not enough, we should never undervalue it. Jesus tells us in Luke that the servant who knows what his master wants and ignores it or insolently does whatever he pleases will be thoroughly thrashed. But if he does a poor job through ignorance, he'll get off with a slap on the wrist. Great gifts mean great responsibilities. Greater gifts, greater responsibilities. Some are given less, some are given more, but all are given much. There is this tactic in counseling where they try to get to the heart of an issue, where they repeat the question. You may have experienced this when someone asks you, how are you doing? And you say, fine. Then they ask you again, no, how are you doing really? And then you open up. Well, we're going to use that tactic today when we ask ourselves, am I maximizing what God has given me really? Now, at the end of verse 15, we see that the master just went away. He distributes the talents, and then he just goes away. We don't know why, but like most of life, it's because we don't see the whole picture. We don't see all the time that the servant has spent under the master learning his ways and knowing what he wants them to do. And the master knows the heart of his servants and trusts that they will use his investment to continue his good work. He entrusted his property to them. Now, I don't know about you, but God doesn't always give me explicit instructions with the resources he has given me. So what do we do when we're not exactly clear what God wants us to do with the resources he has entrusted us with? Well, Dallas Willard says that in many cases, 
Our need to wonder about or be told what God wants in a certain situation is nothing short of a clear indication of how little we are engaged in His work. In other words, when we know the heart and ways of Jesus so deeply, managing His resources well is second nature. So if you're struggling with what to do about what God has given you, examine your relationship with Him. Get to know the Father and what he wants you to do with his resources will become clearer. So they didn't have clear instructions and they didn't quite know when he was going to return. But he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So what did they do as soon as their master left? They got to work immediately. The second servant didn't complain and say, well, I could really do a lot more if I had five talents. And the third servant said, didn't say, well, count yourselves lucky because I only have one talent. Now, I say the third servant didn't do anything, but he did bury his talent in the ground, which is doing something. It does take some action to keep yourself in your comfort zone. Trust me, I know. Whenever I am procrastinating on an opportunity, I have to wrestle with the excuses that I've made up on why I shouldn't do it. Or I have to appease the promptings of my heart by saying, well, if they're still there when I get back, or if they ask me again, then I'll help them. Out of fear, we're choosing to let others make the decision. So let's see what happens when the master returns. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We see that the first and second servant who doubled their master's investment received the same reward. They were told, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It wasn't the quantity of what they produced. It was the quality of their effort. In the message translation, it says, good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. By fulfilling their responsibility to the best of their ability, they were able to change their relationship from servant to partner. And that's what God wants us for us too. He wants us to partner with Him in His work. Now we get to the third servant. He doesn't do what we learned the first week of this series, that you are 100% responsible for 100% of the decisions that you make. Instead, he blames the master. I know you have high standards and hate careless ways, that you may demand the best and make no allowance for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you, so I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. In hindsight, it is easy to question the investment strategy of this third servant. But sometimes, I do the same thing. I say, God, you got the wrong guy. What if I can't help who you're asking me to help? What if I can't deliver on time? What if I fail? What if I'm not good enough? We all live like this sometimes. We live cautiously. We let pride get in our way. We compare ourselves to others and determine that we're not good enough or we worry about what people will say and so we do nothing. And the master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. We know that comparison is a thief of joy. It not only steals your present joy, it can also steal your future joy. The master says, So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, 
and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast a worthless servant into the utter darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again we ask ourselves, am I maximizing what God has given me, really? If you're like me, you may not be entirely sure about what God has entrusted you with. So there's a couple ways to help you find out. The first is to take a spiritual gifts assessment. There's a link below and then there's one in the description. The, a spiritual gift is a special ability that you use to help bless others. The assessment is a series of statements that you rank on how well they relate to you. There are no right or wrong answers. The next way to discover your spiritual gift is to listen to what God telling, is telling you you're good at. Maybe you feel your heart prompted whenever you are presented with a certain situation, or God is using someone to tell you you have a gift. Now, before you dismiss this step too quickly because you're struggling to write something down, I like how Eugene Pearson uh, drives this point home in his translation of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. That's right, everyone, including you and me. We're each given something to share with the world, but sometimes we don't realize how valuable it is because we compare it to others. So maybe you didn't write down that gift you thought of, or you wrote it down with some hesitation. They say that the best way to determine the value of something is to see what the market says. So sometimes with our gifts, we should put more trust in the value that others place on it instead of the value that we place on it. If I didn't trust the value that others place on me, I wouldn't be speaking before you here today. You know how sometimes when you're presented with an opportunity and you say, well, that's not right for me, but you know who would be great at that? Well, this is the appropriate time to do that. Whether you're at a watch party or watching from home, if you're thinking about somebody that has a gift, let them know. Let them know after the watch party or call or text them later on and encourage them to use that gift to bless others. Even when we know the gift we have and we truly value it for what it's worth, we can still be afraid. A lot of the opportunities in my life are beyond my skill, beyond my experience, and definitely beyond my comfort zone. But I remember the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. There, God wanted to use Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. But Moses thought God had the wrong guy. So he tells God, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. But God didn't choose Moses because of his abilities. He often chooses people who are weak so that they have to rely on him. He asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? See or do not see? Hear or do not hear? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. God tells Moses that the mouth that you're worried about getting tongue-tied, well, I made it, and I can use it. Just trust me. So the next time that you're struggling with some of these same fears, remember Moses and God's patient response. Trust that God has given you everything you need to accomplish what he's asking you to do. The master in the parable wanted the servant to do something more than passively preserve what they'd been given. He wanted them to use their skills and abilities to, toward a productive end. The servant who had five talents had everything necessary to produce five more. The servant who had two talents had everything necessary to produce two more. Even the one who only had one talent had everything necessary to produce one talent more. Whatever you have is enough to accomplish what God is asking you to do. We don't get the, the chance to choose the opportunities that are presented to us, but we do get to choose how we will respond. Now, responding the way that God wants us to is not always easy. 
The key is to stay faithful and let God take care of the success. We can act like the third servant and bury our talent when we worry about what other people will think or our own performance and shy away from the mission. It's easy to be discouraged when we focus on success instead of being faithful. I get discouraged. I lead a community group, or at least I did until the pandemic. And then I let Zoom fatigue be my excuse for not meeting because there weren't enough people logging in or the meeting didn't go as well as I'd hoped. I even put conditions on my response by saying, well, we'll meet again whenever we can meet in person. But God isn't asking us to wait for the if and when. He's calling us to the here and now. Am I maximizing what God has given me, really? In a few weeks, all of us who call Crossbridge home will get the opportunity to put this into practice. When we begin to meet in person, it will be easy to be discouraged because of low attendance or because it just doesn't feel the same because of the safety precautions we put in place. There will be also be opportunities to serve. So I leave you with Paul's words to the Galatians. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the gifts that you give each one of us. Please help us to see ourselves the way that you see us, Lord, and to give us wisdom to know our next steps. Please help us to see these opportunities as a chance to partner with you and to enter into your joy. Please strengthen our resolve to continue the work that you have called us to do. In your strong and powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you in person soon. During this next song, um, take a few minutes or moments to think about someone that you believe um, has a talent or a characteristic that God has entrusted to them and that they um, use really well or or do really good at um, just as a way to encourage our church. So just put that in the little chat um, either during or at the end of this next song. Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on your altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. again set me on fire oh set me on fire here I am God arms wide open I'm pouring Here I am, God, arms 
Jason talked about. We've got the link where you can do that right there below for you. It could be a really great way for you to plug into a particular passion and mission that God has for your life. And again, a reminder, we are looking to regather next weekend. We're excited to do that for you. Please check out the regathering guidelines online at the link below. If you're interested in serving and being a part of helping us get that going, we could definitely use some extra hands for that, no doubt. Uh, please let us know as well. Just shoot me an email. It's west at crossbridgechristian.com. Uh, or you can just uh, fill out a connection card and let us know there as well. Thanks a lot, guys. And we will catch you, whether in person or online, next weekend.